Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 135 of Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. Thank you so much for joining us on this lovely Saturday. Rob Murray Duncan, who is uh, best known as probably Seth in Stargate Circles, as well as Melbourne Jackson, is here live with us. And we're going to be bringing him in in just a moment. But before we get started here, if you like Stargate, and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal if you click that like button. It really makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm and will help the show continue to grow. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click that subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next several uh, weeks on the gateworld.net uh, YouTube channel and more on uh, the Dial the Gates channel itself when we go into hiatus, probably around mid to late June. I haven't decided yet when the show is going to um, end this season as opposed to last season when I was moving out of my house and had, okay, this is the date. So we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens as we move forward here. Rob Murray Duncan is joining us live. So if you're in youtube.com slash dial the gate, uh, you'll be able to submit questions to our moderating team. They'll get them over to me and I'll uh, consider uh, using uh, a handful for uh, the show or as, as many as are uh, interesting and, uh, and uh, cool. So without further ado, Seth himself, Rob Murray Duncan. Hello, sir. Welcome to dial the gate. Hello, David. Very nice to be here and to see all of you, although I can't see you. Glad, glad that you're listening in. <laughs> How are you doing? You well? I'm doing great. I'm doing well. Yeah, I'm in California. Okay. You know, I've, li I've lived a few places over the time, but uh, things in California were good. During these past couple of years, I was actually very busy doing um, new play readings with a company in New York City called Circle Repertory Theater Company. Okay. So that kept, kept things sharp and kept me awake. That was helpful. <laughs> Okay. Any any um, particular plays you'd like to shout out? Anything in, in uh, particular that has been particularly rewarding for you to work on? Um, in the past, um, uh, I was fortunate to understudy John Malkovich in the production of Burn This. It was actually the world premiere production in Los Angeles. Wow. So the greater gift was watching them rehearse for five weeks and seeing how that was going on. And, uh, oh, you know, it was, it was a little bit frightening. There were there were only um, there were three uh, understudies for four roles. The other male doubled up. And uh, I actually had a nightmare once I had. I, I had bet you did. Uh, it was it was, um, you know, those theaters where the, they train medical students and there's the bed down below. And yeah, the operating three. theater. Right. So I was in one of those sitting there in my underwear. All you shrinks will get a hoot out of that. And there was nobody there but me, like right in the center, halfway up. And all of a sudden, I hear this door open behind me. And at the top, John comes in. And he walks down and over and down and over and down and over until he's sitting right behind, or right beside me. And he goes, he goes, you know, I realize you think you're hot shit. But just, just. <laughs> just settle like, down <laughs> that, was the end of the, that was the end of the dream um, but it, it was a great experience and i uh finally uh, got to do the show down in san diego about four years later so it was fantastic oh wow. all right yeah. that's, that's legit so <laughs> we want to make sure that everyone knows that both rob and i are going to be at GateCon in september over i believe labor day weekend wonderful uh, so yeah. september 1st to the 4th uh, so Vancouver, everyone needs to, to check it out. Uh, it is the Stargate event of the year. We were supposed to have one a couple of years ago, but COVID. But now we are back in action. And so if you want to check out Rob, uh, meet him live and ask him uh, questions. Uh, besides today, obviously, we're going to give you a chance to do that today. Uh, GateCon is is the place to be. Is this your first GateCon? Uh, my first GateCon. My first gate con, I did okay. a I did a Chevron in England. Okay, how was that experience? What's the Stargate convention like? Oh, it, it's incredible! It's incredible. Um, it was my first one, so you know uh, the fans were from all over Europe. Um, yes, and they were extremely cool. And it, you know, when people talk about Stargate being a family, often we're talking about what happens on set. But I realized the family is global. 
and um, everybody was warm and charming and funny and just really down to earth and chill. And, and, you know, you go off into different groups and you talk to different people. Mm -hmm. And then at night we went dancing and, and, you know, it was a big area and we were all dancing and stuff like that. There were like f uh, five other actors there as well. So it was very, very cool. And then we were supposed to do a couple more, but of course the last couple of years Correct. canceled those. So hopefully in the near future, that'll happen again. Where yeah, was very... Chevron? What, what, what city was that in? It was in, it was in London specifically at Heathrow, uh... out by Heathrow Airport. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I was once in the Governor General's foot guards in Canada. I'm originally from Canada. Okay. So it was great to go and watch the changing of the guard in London and, you know, sort of be inspired by that. It, uh, it was very British. And, and that, so I had a day off, day off when I could go and do that. So that was cool. I'd argue there's nothing more British than that. No. <laughs> Other than the Queen inviting you to tea. Right. Exactly. Jeez. Man, oh, man. Mm. What? Um, made you get into this field? How old were you? What did you see? What did you experience where it was like, you know what, this is what I want to do All right. with my life? Yeah. So um, in about seventh grade, a teacher took us out on a field trip to see a film. And it was the first film I'd ever seen. And it was the old black and white of Romeo and Juliet. And I just was in awe of the world they created. And, and I you know, kind of fell in love with Olivia Hussey. But so that was the first real impact. And then um, some kids from some fellows from high school, we went and did these in, in native stories in the uh, Museum of Natural History for young kids over the weekend. And again, I saw it back at me where they're just like, oh, and right. there's a real connection. And so the final thing that did it for me was in um, I moved to Kingston, Ontario, and I, my theater arts teacher, Gord Love, who I'm still in touch with, was incredibly inspiring. And theater class was different than anything else because it was a collaboration of people working together and being really chill with each other and trying to make something out of that. And, you know, it's different than sitting through English class or mathematics or anything else. So Gord was incredibly inspiring. So um, I, you know, long, you know, then I ended up living in Ottawa most of my life and, you know, everybody works in the government. So I applied to work in the government and I ended up working with the Mounties. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, I thought, oh, this is a sexy job. Maybe I'll join the Mounties. And so I thought I don't really have great credentials. So I quit the job and I went into the foot guards and I was top recruit and they wanted me to join as a, a, a marksman and all this stuff. But uh, when I went for my medical exam, my doctor was like, you want you want to be a cop and I'm a police officer and I'm like yeah, yeah he goes is that what you want to do I said well you know and I'd already been doing a lot of theater musical theater around Ottawa so I said well you know I guess I mean it's Ottawa right everybody works in the government he goes well my wife is a is a, is a psychologist and she'll do some tests and and sort of mm -hmm. she's not going to tell you what you should be but she's going to give you some ideas so we did the Rorschach test, you know, the <laughs> oh, God, okay. um, my, my favorite one was there was a, a white eight by eight card with a black ink drawing on it. And it's a, and, and all of these, there were about eight of them. And she said, tell me what's missing. And she'd hold one up and I got them all except that one. And it was a pony running down a hill out of control with no, with a saddle, but no rider. And I left and I called and said, I know what it is. It's, there's no rider. She goes up oh, too late. Oh. But I, 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 I kind of, I, I like that rebellious tone to the whole idea. So, <laughs> right. so a week later, she says, okay, come on in. I've got some information for you. So I go in and she says, now these are just metaphors. These aren't mm -hmm. factual jobs you should be doing, but this is just an idea. And she said, on one hand, you're a dancer. And on the other hand, you're a captain of a ship. So in the end, it kind of came true in some ways in that um, I got into directing and producing, which is to me creative guidance of a ship, you know, you know correct. So so but but just just to hear those things was was good. And then my application for the Mounties was already at play and I saw them come onto the base to talk to my sergeants and stuff. They went to my girlfriend's father and her brother came up to me later and he said, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but dad told the Mounties he thought you really wanted to be an actor. And I was like, what was cool about that, David, is that I'd never, my father wasn't present. So I never had permission to even think of acting as a job. So even though it came at me secondhand, that was actually kind of a light bulb went off and said, oh, I can try and do this. And my mom at that point had said, historically, it was great. Cause she said, you know, Robert, 
you've got a job, you're at a certain age, maybe you should try to find your own place now. And that changed my life. I was shocked. I was a little angry because it's that moment of growing up. <laughs> you don't want to. Hear. Yeah, you're being pushed out of your yes. of your comfort and, zone. And, and it was so necessary. I I went to Toronto. I started acting. I started asking questions. The director said, "You need training." So I got some summer stock work up at uh, Red Barn Theater with some famous Canadians, uh, Tom Kneebone and and uh, William Needles. And I asked Mr. Needles. I said, "Mr. Needles, where do I get training?" And he said, well, if you want to work in Canada and the United States, go, tr go train in the U.S. And, and understand there was not much going on in Toronto at that point, mm -hmm. training wise. And then he said, uh, if you want to work in Canada and England, go study in England. So I auditioned for RADA and the Neighborhood Playhouse. And the, the RADA thing is, a, is, an, is an, another story. But uh, I, got, I went to the Playhouse in, in New York City and I was, I was literally interviewed by Sanford Meisner. He had gotten reti he retired. He got bored. So he came back to teach right in the two years I was there. So anyway, that's that launched that launched everything. Toronto was a significant you know, every every one of those moments when mm -hmm. I look back was critical to me, you know, being into the acting world. Tell me about a role that transformed you or your perception in a way that you didn't expect or that pushed you in a way that you didn't expect that kind of has carried with you for the rest of your life. Is, is there one that you can point to that has, that has kind of done that? Mm. In, in some way burn this, but yes. there, there was a, a new play I did down and they, they do tend to be theater because I've done a lot more theater and the theater roles tend to be more uh, intense emotionally and stuff. Uh, it was a play called Fakes. And it was about, it's a true story about Hans von Meegren, who was a famous painter in around the time yeah. of the 1930s, 40s. Um, and he was so angry that the critics wouldn't pay attention to him that he painted a, 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 he painted a painting in the style of a Vermeer. It wasn't a copy of a Vermeer. It was one that when you looked at it, you thought Vermeer did this. Right. So, and it, and it worked. And then he was supposed to say, see, you don't know what you're doing. I'm the artist. But he made so much money that he kept doing it and it was in roaring... someone else's style yes okay kept, but but they kept thinking they were unfound vermeers oh they even, no. they even built a, a true wing. story the true story and they built a wing in uh one of the dutch countries for for his painting wow. and then so the reason he could sell them all because there's a lot of scrutiny when you when you're looking at you know selling paintings because they're millions of dollars so so that scrutiny was reduced because it was the time of the nazis and so mm -hmm. they were buying stuff all over the place and they weren't paying attention so all of these things got sold so then it became known that he did this and strangely enough he now had to prove they were done so well they didn't believe that he made them and he he had to prove that he painted them or faced the death penalty for selling a national treasure in the time of the Nazi invasion. So um, the writer wrote a beautiful speech and they recalled it paint for paint for your life. And it was like the judge said, I need you to prove it. So go in your cell. You've got four days and mm -hmm. it would take me six months to do one of these or von Meegren. So, uh, <laughs> okay. so basically it's like having a gun to your head yeah. and that that whole identity stuff. There's something about that play because wow. you see in, in a slightly deeper meaning, you can, you can, I could copy Malkovich, but he still originated it. I didn't copy him. I, I borrow a couple of things, but if someone copies something, that's still not an original work of art, even though it looks beautiful. The, the artist is the creator of something new. And that von, that von Meegren was not never that. So his cause was, Shallow. So it was just a lot to think about in terms yeah. of what we value in our lives and all of that. And it was an extremely emotional play. And that's always fun to reach out and destroy your audience, you know. <laughs> God, absolutely. Was it one yeah. scene? Was it or was it like a whole series of moments over his over his career? What I, I'm interested to see uh, to hear how this this particular play was configured. It was, and I think the writer really wrote it as a film script because the scenes were so quick sometimes and they were okay. trying to figure out how it was going to change. But it was over a, a pretty long period of his time because he met, a well, I don't know if this is true, but in the story, he met a gallery owner. Okay. And she's an older woman, very wealthy. And so she they lived together and he 
um, you now he has a forum to put his paintings out there. So it, it was probably over about a 20 year span because when he got all the money, he started getting into, um, I don't know what the drug of the day was, um, but the, he got all screwed up from drugs okay. and he was just partying, you know? Yeah, right. very wow. decadent time. Wow. Tell us about your first episode in Stargate, The Gamekeeper. Mm. Tell us about getting that role. Yeah, that was cool. I didn't, I didn't know much about Stargate, you know, and, and I showed up and I, and the cool thing was I, um, I had met Michael Shanks mm. about five years earlier when I did a pass through Vancouver to check it out. I was there for like a month and way back, I, I don't know the date, but that was, was uh, X-Files was the only thing that was going mm -hmm. on. It was very quiet. So I, I left, but where I was staying, the friend of a friend was saying, Hey, let's go see this friend of mine's doing his final production at university of British Columbia. And Michael was doing the Shakespeare piece and I, I'm embarrassed. I don't remember the exact play, but I remember him. I mean, he was just like, boom, you know, um, um, so th then when I got on set, we talked about that because he remembered me because he knew I'd understudied Malkovich and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So we got to talk about that. But the um, getting on the set that day was very cool. You know, we had like sort of the hippies kind of vibe going and mm -hmm. the actress was came in. The actress came in from Toronto, Lisa Bunting. And um, I, uh, the director, uh, Bill Corcoran, was also very good. And the scene we had repeated over and over and over again, and they just enjoyed what we were doing. So, so it was a, it was a, a, a cool family. So speaking of family, when um, I went to the craft services table, which is where you can get snacks and coffee, I was going <laughs> for a coffee, and it was in another room, but when you opened the door, it was another studio, and it was huge, and it was full of props. And it was like, I mean, the set, pieces there was a stargate there was a this there was like spaceships i mean it was really wild and i saw these two these things so i went to um michael greenberg producer yeah. uh, writer and i said michael i'm directing a play right now and it takes place in new york city and if i could get four of those they were like 30 foot columns with cross steel with bolts they were actually made of wood but they look like those subway platform stand, you know, okay. struts. And, and I said, if I could have four of those and I'll pay you whatever you need, you know, he said, give me 20 minutes. And he comes back. He says, you can use them. We have others stored in another building. You can grab those. Uh, you don't need to pay us. Just bring them back in this bring condition that you found them. I mean, who does that? Yeah. It's, you know, the, the Stargate, the, those productions are big, big, big pieces of machinery and they don't have time for this stupidity, you know? And, and it made the show. Matter of fact, when we were taking them down at the end, some family members and friends were sitting in the audience watching us tear the set down. And we started leaning those over and they're like, oh, we thought those were holding up the ceiling. Right. You know? <laughs> but, um, but the Stargate people were ultra cool. Um, during a break, oh no, that was Stargate. Let, let me stay on, um, on uh, Gamekeeper. But it was, you know, I, I didn't really have time to read the whole script. So I didn't quite know what we were doing, but um, You're in it, one section of a larger story, yeah. Yes, yes, it was great. I mean, it was a it was a rush. Wow, that's it was one of my favorite episodes back in the day because um, we got to Dwight Schultz is in that episode as well, a brilliant actor. Yes, um, we also have uh, uh, Kowalski back in in one of the other shards of that. Uh, whole presentation um but with this one we actually got to see how daniel lost his folks uh and that was really out of left field and the fact that we experience it again and again and it's yeah. just like you know this this sucks and at the same time we're this is the first time i'm watching this it's like the the gamekeeper is testing him he's like you know if you keep on tweaking this what would happen if you you know, managed to get them out of it. And Daniel mm. at one point tries mm. and it realizes, you know, at this, at this point, one, one way or another, he can't change the past. What's, what's happened has happened. And he just starts letting it happen again and again. Um, what was that like rewatching that episode? I, you told me. Um, you thank, yeah. It and, again. Yeah. Thank you for making that suggestion. I, I really loved it because what was, you know, when you first watch an episode that you're in, all you watch is yourself, you know, and then in watching it, I really, 
th th that's what makes Stargate so great is the storytelling, the layers of storytelling. There's so much to say about that, right? Letting go of the past, reliving the past, not letting it go, having it go through your mind, go through your mind, go through your mind. So there's a greater, there's a greater level of what they're talking about there. And then, you know, we'll, we'll get to that other episode where there, there's always a, a human story under all of these sci-fi you know, levels. And that's what makes the show great. It's um, mythology. Mythology mm -hmm. is taken from, you know, ancient times. So they've done a, they did a great job with that. And I watched uh, one of your writers just the other day, sorry, Jonathan, um, he was brilliant. And, and he obviously has a, 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 a great uh, resource in terms of mythology and storytelling. There's, there, there's a lot of depth there. And, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it always, I always go back to, to this episode in terms of a great character piece for, for uh, Daniel and for Jack, because we see parts of uh, their lives that, that really could have been, and it establishes Daniel's parents as archaeologists. You know, is mm -hmm. the, and we we later find out um, his uh, his his mother's father was was into that field as well. So it really it really lends credence to what he did in his career. He really wasn't going to be able to. He really wasn't interested in doing anything else, despite the fact that as tragic as it was, you know, this is this is something that really ended his parents' careers and their lives and his, you know, chance to be raised by them. This is still what he wanted to do. Yes. So. And 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 as, as an actor, Daniel got to stretch because he was working on that. Yeah. That's not an easy emotion of, you know, your parents passing away. So anyway, no. passing away. Exactly. Mm. Then Seth, the next <laughs> the next year. Uh this yeah. was Quite a switch for you, going from um, uh, a parent of a of an SG team member to a Goa Uld. Uh, Bill Bill Kukorin, uh directed this one, uh, and then I believe uh, who who wrote this episode. This was Jonathan Glasner's episode, one yes. of the creators of of the series. Mm. Tell us about Seth. Hail Dorothy. <laughs> oh man yeah no that was uh that was a trip you know um i didn't know i was cast for quite a while and it was they were taking a long time and uh then finally what happens is you get a call from the wardrobe department before your agent even knows it happens a lot because the wardrobe's right on top of it and once they get the flag they call you and then i called my agent and said hey by the way she goes oh those wardrobe people and uh, they were super cool they noticed i had a pierced ear so they gave me an earring and that was nice. It's probably the last time I wore one. And, uh, <laughs> and um, that that leather jacket was made of, you know, oh. I don't know if they do it the same way nowadays, but it was made of a number of different leathers. And uh, but then getting on the set, you know, it was a it was a location shoot. So location shoots can be a little more tense because the crew has a lot more physical work to do. They have to get up earlier to get there with their equipment, you know, unload the equipment, get it. So there's a lot of um, so. What I learned to do on sets is I, I'm pretty quiet until I'm spoken to. I'm just there because there's a lot of hubbub going on and you never know, you know, what's happening and they need to communicate with each other. But it was right. the most, again, it was just the most professional, uh, smart production and everybody was super friendly. I had a, you know, my little bevy of um, mostly females down at my feet. Right. And um, one of them said to me, he, she said, and it was during, a, they were resetting the camera or something. I'm sitting there and she goes, do you, do you know what she does? And I'm like, um, no. She goes, she's a Mountie. I'm like, oh, she, she goes, yeah, she looks like she's 12, right? And I'm like, well, that's cool. And I didn't bother going into my experience, but they were, everybody was just really chill. Wow. And um, uh, oh, during a break, I went outside and I actually, you know, I thought it was sunny because we had the lights blasting in the windows. Into the windows. <laughs> Yeah, and it was drizzly and stuff, but still, you know, I just want to get some air. And the, the the DP, the director of photography was out there and he said, wow, you play a great bad guy. And I said, <laughs> yeah. I started apologizing. I was like, you know, I know I do so many. He goes, don't say that. He goes, Donald Sutherland did a lot. And then he tried to stay away from it and he didn't work for a number of years. And then he went back to that, which led him into some of the more realistic roles that he wanted to do. Right, and yeah, great. you know, it's like you go with what you got. So that's, it's all cool, you know, but um, on that set, it was, uh, you know, it, it moved pretty quickly. Everybody knew what they were doing and, you know, we just, you know, rock and rolled and went along. I was on that shoot for five days and the first shoot, um, Gamekeeper, was one day. So the five-day run was very, very cool. And um, 
um, Mr. Anderson was very friendly. I talked more with um, uh, Michael and Amanda because just because we had a break and we went to this break room for a while. And then I could, you know, uh, we reflected back on when we reflected back about his play and right. Amanda was very, very friendly. And, and, you know, Mr. Anderson has a lot to do. He's also executive producer. So he's running around making decisions and stuff. And I mean, that's an incredible workload. And then he keeps that wonderful smarmy acting going on the side. I mean, it, that's uh, I ran into him once when I was jogging around. Uh, Stanley Park, which is a six mile run. And mm -hmm. again, it was a, a drizzly Sunday morning. And we're, I'm coming along, who's that? And as we pass each other, we're like, I look familiar, but we just kept going, <laughs> you know? Because I, I know for him that has to happen all the time. And I just, you know, I'm sure he's just enjoying a break for a change. So I didn't want to bug him. Well, but yeah, every, Vancouver used to be such a, a small town, especially in the earlier, you know, days of, of Stargate SG1. And now it's just absolutely exploded. Yes. So. Yes. It's just it's just become an industry town, and Stargate is one of those pillars that really that really brought it up with the the professionalism that they had, with the money that they had into production going into seventeen seasons of this thing. Mm. You know, it had to have just been a wild ride to just be a part of it, just to sit back and watch it take place, and then to do your thing. And you you realize it more later. You know, at the time it's like, oh, I got a job. This is great. Right. And then as it goes, you go, wow, this thing. And you know, what was I? Season two, three. Um... Both two and three. That's yeah, right. So yeah, and we're here. We are on. talking about it. Twenty-two years later, yeah, and you haven't aged a day. I think you've got a sarcophagus somewhere. <laughs> well, there's the other story I didn't tell you yet. When I went <laughs> for that, that, when I went for that coffee, I saw the Stargate. Yeah, I just got back, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Jeez. <laughs> But I also love the story in the in the Seth one about the family, you know, conflict between families and Tilk's asking, you know, do you not unconditionally love your children? And yeah. it was very moving. That was a very moving episode with the coming togethers and the understandings. It makes me well up right now thinking about it. But brilliant on the part of the writers. Really great. It is. It, this is a real thing. You know, I think I think that one of the things about this episode that really that really hits me hard is that cults harness hearts and minds and separate families mm. and take um take loved ones from each other and you know we've all you know all you can see all all kinds of examples of it where you know the the the, the parents or will go to the police and police can't do anything you know, right what do you what do you want us to do you want us to there's there's no i i there's there's we have we have no reason to to infringe on on this this group of people's you know rights and 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 pull someone out of out yeah. there who doesn't want to be found right and what do you do i had i had yeah. a fifth in fifth grade i had a teacher who who lost a child to one of these groups and she didn't see her for years i don't, I don't even know what happened but i mean it's a, it's a real thing yeah I think a person needs a lot of money and you hire a special team of people to go in and kidnap them. That's the only way it can happen. But yeah. uh, I think that same scenario can happen within, within a couple, you know, when somebody works somebody over and they kind of aren't themselves anymore. And then you're like, where, where did my sister go or whatever it is? You know what I mean? I know that's a different thing, but it's still kind of, in the psychological realm. It still kind of exists, I think in many ways. Mm. I have some fan questions here for you, if you don't mind right. getting to some of these. General Maximus, how did the experience on Stargate c compare to some of the other projects of the same scale that you've done? I think, you know, all of them are professional. Um, I, look, I worked on another sci-fi show there. I was, had 12 episodes. I was mm -hmm. reoccurring. And it was a heavy prosthetic job and all this kind of stuff. And I asked one of the eight, and I'd worked three other roles on it before. And uh, First Wave, kind of, yes? Yes. Okay. Right. And I, I decided at the end of that one, I was going to leave town because um, just to try something new. Yeah. But I asked the AD, uh, the first assistant director, I said, I noticed like directors work differently. And he said, there's three ways. He goes, there's a director who knows exactly what they want to shoot. And they do that. And the day goes pretty well. It can go a little bit over. Then there's a director who doesn't know what they're really doing. They don't understand editing or framing. And they, those days go over, over time, mm. people get hurt because they'll be running, you know, as characters running through the woods, trips on something, they're tired, yep. the crew's Start tired. Start getting exhausted, yep. 
then there's the director who knows exactly what they're doing and they've made a shot list, mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. a storyboard. But that way, the shot list, then the makeup people can be ready for what's coming next. The wardrobe people, every uh, if there's armament, you know, that, that person's ready and everything's bam, bam. And, and that's the way it should be because uh, there's no, I mean, although it's odd because a lot of TV directors come out of nowhere and I'm like, wow, how, uh, how do these people get this job? But um, anyway, so Stargate has that down. Uh, um, most of the episodes on First Wave had that down um, because it's time and money and health. Right. And the unions are very strong and they help us too. So, um, but Stargate, I think Stargate just will always remain the top. Um, my personal experience with the people that were on it, the professionals of the crew, um, how quickly the camera people worked. Um, I, I don't know if you saw my bio. I, um, I was living in New York during 9-11 and I went back to oh, film wow. school. Okay. I went back to film school to because uh, there was a lull in the industry. So it's a th I took a three month full intensive filmmaking program, which actually helped me really understand what all of those every single department does. I can walk on a set and know there should be a trash can over there, you know. But anyway, right. I, I'm really appreciative of the professionalism of all of those companies there. Alicia Cuoco, um, what character took you time to get under? the skin of of the character and really figure out what made it tick i'm pretty quick um okay. i, I the, the meisner stuff is pretty straightforward it's um okay. understanding what you want and how do you feel about it okay seth wanted power and i'm angry that these people are getting in my way it's i you know i can get into the story i can get into the mythology but as an actor in that moment it doesn't really help me it's not going to make a hoot. I did a play with a guy. I was a, I was a, a prisoner in the Middle East and a, a pawn for the government. And, and it was based on a true story of a professor. And he gave me books. And I said, it just doesn't matter. You know, I want to be home with my wife. And I know these people are going to kill me. How do I feel about it? Now let's go. So I get into things very quickly and because of that. And, you know, I'll give you a quick example. If you were driving down a highway or freeway and some person in a red uh, sports car goes bombing by you and changing lanes recklessly and you're of course you're like Rrr. as they frequently do right but then you find out where you get to where you're going and there's a there's a hospital across the street yeah. and that guy's <clears throat> taking his wife out of the yeah. car because she's pregnant so you suddenly go ah mm -hmm. so as an actor, you look at the script and find those ah moments in terms of mm -hmm. why do I feel these things, you know, and you, you, you know, as an actor, those are the things you do. What is the circumstance? What do you want? Yeah. The, the, the goal, if, if you look at the, the tapestry of, of the gold over the course of, you know, eight or nine seasons of, of SG-1, they were always out for, generally, generally speaking, not all of them, but most of them were out for absolute power and control. And when you look at some of these quieter gold they, several of them are just are more than happy to settle for a certain amount and then just be left alone. Right. And Seth was one of these who, you know, didn't necessarily want to take over the earth. Maybe in a few thousand years, that was his game plan. But he was very content to have his enclave, to have his er his harem and, you know, his his technological advances with his with his weaponry and just kind of exist and, you know, I think that makes for a very different look at a Gould compared to one who's interested in world domination. He could have been left alone for another thousand years. You never known he was there. Right. And yes, yes, yes. Uh, oh, gosh, I was going to say something about that and I just lost it. Um, never mind. It'll be oh, I know what it is. I also, <laughs> on that note, most TV shows have a good guy in the lead. And I think it's time that we had a good gold in the lead, you know, <laughs> let's wreak some havoc. Uh, actually, you know, there was a plug. <laughs> abs absolutely. Did you uh, get a chance to meet Cliff Simon before he passed? I did not. <sighs> I did not. Yeah, that was Man. tragic. What what a brilliant human being and a brilliant he, actor. And he affected so many people. I mean, so many people miss him and loved him and respected yeah. what he did and was entertained by him. So, yeah, that was sad. That was very sad. Absolutely. Uh, Lock Watcher, the hand device. Tell us about wearing the hand device and your impressions mm. of some of these props. That was nice. I, um, that, they have a weight to them because they're metal, yes. they're not plastic. And, uh, and then I had to, um, you know, I had to grab Amanda and flip her head side to side. And but actually it was one of those acting things 
where she was doing the work and my wrist was just going like this, you know, right. but that, that, but that thing was designed in a way, you know, didn't have any sharp edges and whatnot. And of course, then she got her due with me later, but no, <laughs> Most it, definitely. it was very, very cool. Cause then when I come down the stairs, was it my left hand? Yeah. When I come down the stairs and I'm going to zap uh, my two leads, I thought I need something more than just, so I threw the growl into it, like, you know, yeah. and the, the beam came out. Uh, the, the, side, the special effects guy there, guys there were very clear to me on what they needed about certain things, like hold that so they can get, you know, place the beam in it. Correct. And then um, my glowing eyes are like, try to be really still because we're going to, you know. <laughs> so that was, uh, and that was a bit ahead of its time for its day. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I want one of those. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be going to do, if I can say this, I'm going to be doing sure. a, a Stargate fan film. I'm going to shoot that in England in August where Seth will be represented and uh, they're getting all those doodads. So I'm really curious to see how this works, but I'll certainly be posting it. So a uh, young uh, director named Sam Cockings, who I met at the uh, Chevron event in London. He's um, very talented. He's doing green screen with some very serious uh, visuals of ships and whatnot battles and stuff like that so it'll be a lot of fun we featured some of his work in a in a recent uh, episode with uh, joseph malazzi where he's, he's starting to test some of these ideas out he's 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 very good so what, what was joseph malazzi doing right uh, i had i had him on to discuss i think oh i see one separate. of sgu yeah so oh, joe's yeah. wasn't in, joe wasn't in in samuel's piece no he wasn't no. he was he yeah, was okay. doing an episode with me and i plugged sam's uh bit for that gotcha. so it's very gotcha. cool i i heard that you were doing this and i'm glad to hear that this is moving forward so this is great yeah cool you know everything i don't but i have my ear to the ground so <laughs> Teresa mc did archaeology or egyptology ever appeal to you uh, growing up um i was always a bit of a uh, i use this in a positive way i was always a bit of a science geek um <laughs> i was taking things apart my dad had a three horsepower motor boat motor and i it didn't work so i took it apart oh. and then i tried to put it together and there's some pieces left over so that didn't work so well but i was always doing that and then i um um i got it i'll just tell you this short story so i would we would go get on our bikes and go to this place called the museum of Ti science and technology in ottawa and they had the gemini capsule like the real one oh, touring cool. the country and i was like oh and then yeah. um then they landed on the moon and then my mom got me a lunar landing module model, which I put together with the orbiter. And I, you know, they had, um, there was a chocolate bar with gold wrapper. So I put gold around the feet and gold around it. And my sister was getting married. So I took this like four and a half foot long box and I flipped it on its side, threw out the lid, covered it with black crate paper, put tin foil on the bottom, put my models in there. I hung the, the, ro the uh, orbiter up, up in, 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 by threads. And then I stuck blue Christmas lights in it. Oh, I'd, invite my, I'd invite my friends over after sunset and then I'd plug it in. They'd be like, "Woo, this was cool. So I, um, I then joined the rocket club in high school and launched a rocket. And um, that's kind of been, uh, you know, a lot of my, <laughs> my interest in terms of um, sci-fi. But I, when I was a kid, I enjoyed, they had a place in Ottawa called Max Gimming's Farm, which is a science farm. And you could go there and they learn how to like, count how many, you know, lumber, how much lumber is in a square thousand feet or look at the guppies and all yes. that. And I think I would have gone toward being some sort of nature person, studying of nature, which would have certainly come in handy now. But that, that very, it, it intrigued me. I love being out in the country and I love being with nature and, and studying all of that. Uh, Pac-Man D3, uh, what did you think of the Jaffa joke involving the Setesh guard? <laughs> Um, the one Jaffa joke I, that's ever been told in all. Does anybody? Of... Does anybody get it? <laughs> I, I think I think I, they're just they're just looked as as beneath the other the other guards. Maybe maybe they maybe they're always sick or something. I don't know. <laughs> I thought it was I thought it was perfect because it was so stupid. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, and how he enjoyed it himself was great. right. I, I, I enjoyed it for that. It's like the joke on the joke. And that, that was very cool. It'd be, it's better that it didn't have any heavy factual reality in it, you know? Exactly. Something, Clever something writing. going on there. Clever writing. Summer wanted to know, uh, have you remained a fan of the franchise? Would you be interested in returning if they did a new show? Oh, heck yeah. Of course. You know, everybody's aware of the Amazon MGM thing. Yes. I mean, 
I think, I think, you know, my opinion, of course, everybody would love to be working on it again, but um, uh, I think they'll bring back certain people for little guests and things like that. And if, if, if let's assume it goes forward and, but who knows how MG or how Amazon will handle that. But yeah, yeah, of course, man. I mean, it would be an honor just to be part of that legacy, that history, which I think is a legacy. What, uh, other than the, the fan film that's being uh, developed by, uh, um, Samuel, what else can we uh, expect you in and down the road here? What should we keep an eye open for? Well, I might be doing some theater in New York City. Okay. So that, that'll be hard to get to. But um, I, so I tend to, this goes back to my geekishness. I tend to go into different areas from time to time. So years ago, I created an animated pilot that taught children the written Chinese characters. Ah, which okay. Took, which took me, you know, took years to do and took me all over the world. I went to China four times. I went through uh, um, uh, Korea, Hong Kong, Italy. And then most recently, I, well, not most recently, one other thing more recently was that I um, was editing and directing an, a documentary about uh, post-traumatic stress based on combat, combat trauma. And I'm pretty much done that. A, f a friend of mine was a lifetime member of the Actors Studio uh, and a veteran of the war in Vietnam um, was told it, at the studio that he should try to write something about this. So he wrote what was a, in the beginning a one-man show, and then there was a second character in there, a female that represents life and death and all this stuff. And then I directed him in that play in L.A. He took that play back to Vietnam to do it in front of the former enemy. And so now I'm, I'm pretty much done the documentary. I just need to get the financing to do the cleanup of audio and stuff, which is the smaller part. So I go off in these different directions. And right now... Uh, my younger brother is a fairly prominent, uh, very talented animator who's had his own company now for 11, going on 12 years. And we're putting together the business aspect of doing a film, feature animated film, which will be his first. His last gig, he was in London. He did uh, the animation for the Mary, his company did the animation for the Mary Poppins Returns film. Okay. So, um, so I'm like, you know. Yeah. So, but the point is, I really want to get back to New York and do acting, but also TV film stuff from there because there's also Toronto available. So that's kind of my goal once I get this other stuff out of the way. Well, you know, going back to your roots and what you're passionate about, I, I, I completely uh, get that. And I will keep my ear to the ground as well. I may just have to come and see you because it's been a while since I've been to New York and I want to go back. Yeah, cool. I'll so, let you know. Uh, please yeah. do. Absolutely. Uh, sir, this has been uh, such a pleasure having you on. And um, where can we uh, where can we follow you? Are there any uh, special social medias or anything in particular that you want us to to? Point I'm out? a little I'm a little old school with the okay. uh, Facebook. Facebook is pretty you know. Or if you want to check stuff, is good old IMDb.com. Okay. But um, Facebook, I, I do have an Instagram, and I, I use it so seldom I don't know what it is right now. But okay. I'll send that to you, and then if you want to forward it, that would be great. I will add it to the the description of the episode for sure. Sure. And uh, my email address is in the IMDb thing if you want to do that, because I, I welcome any questions people have and, and any, anything you want to know. I appreciate you, Rob, for coming on. This this means a great deal. And I'm looking forward to to catching up with you in person in GateCon yes. uh, in Vancouver in uh, September. David, you have the coolest show. I've, le I've learned so much more and you're definitely in, you know your stuff. So that's really the least. I you appreciate know? you. I yeah. You take care of yourself and we will be in touch. I look forward to to working with you some more. Goodbye, everybody. Be well, sir. Bye bye. Rob Murray Duncan, Seth from Stargate SG1, and of course, Daniel Jackson's father as well. Before we go, if you like what you've seen in this episode, please consider clicking that uh, like button, helping us to to spread the word uh, about the series. It um, means a great deal to me to have you out there. Dial the Gate is brought to you every week for free, and we do appreciate you watching. And if you want to support the show further, buy yourself some of our themed swag. We offer t-shirts, tank tops, sweatshirts, and hoodies for all ages, as well as cups and other accessories in a variety of sizes and colors at dialthegate.com slash merch. And thank you so much for your support. Next week, we have State of the Gate. 
with Jenny Stiven returning. I don't know about Darren yet. We're going to uh, see if we can get him in this episode. I'd, I'd like to have him, but uh, you know, scheduling as as it is, uh, it's beginning to get closer to the summer and with families and everything else is going to be a little bit more interesting. But Jenny is definitely joining us for State of the Gate, the next episode. This is going to be the 28th of May. We're looking at 12 noon Pacific time right now. If that changes, I will let everyone know. Uh, bring us up to speed on what's going on with the Amazon acquisition of MGM. A lot has been happening behind the scenes, but it's a question of just how much we're able to talk about. Um, so we'll we'll see how that's uh, going down. I also want to discuss the antitrust situation as well. When you've got these larger entities like Disney absorbing Fox and Lucasfilm, and uh, at what point, I want to raise the question, at what point is too much too much? And I want to have that conversation with her as well, being in, involved in the industry over the past uh, few decades here. I think she would have an interesting perspective on that. We will be uh, inviting you to submit questions to Jenny to ask about uh, the merger next week. Whoever asks the most interesting question in my mind, I will be asking uh, for the uh, email address of this individual so that they can get this cute little custom Stargate SG-1 pop Daniel Jackson uh, figurine on the top of this signed by the box. The top of the box is signed by uh, Michael Shanks. So this will be yours if you submit uh, a question to Jenny next week regarding the merger of uh, Amazon uh, and MGM. Uh, if we uh, think that your question is is the question that deserves uh, this little guy here. So I hope you can tune in and submit questions. We also have uh, another fan artist as well who will be uh, will be following up in that uh following that episode next week as well. I'll have more details about that as this comes out. I'm still organizing some information here as we move forward. Thanks so much again to Rob Murray Duncan for joining us uh, in this episode. It was terrific to have him. Uh, General Maximus had a question for me. When SG4 comes around, will you stay independent as you are now, or would you like to be an official member of the crew and be involved in the media side of things? That's an MGM question. Um, I am at their beck and call. So if if they need something from me, I will be happy to uh, provide um, uh, support. During production of Stargate SG-1, when I was in Atlantis and Universe, when I was over at Gate World, we had open lines of communication with MGM and with the production studio. I imagine it would be something similar going on here because regardless of however SG-4 is going to be configured, whether it's going to be a Brad production or whether it's going to be something brand new, um, I do wish to be involved. So they will definitely be aware of me in terms of reaching out to cast and crew for interviews as the project goes uh, forward. M MGM is aware of me, so there there will be um, there there will be at the very least open lines of communication. So we'll see what happens. Would I like to be involved in in SG four? Perhaps. Uh, it would depend, it would depend on the capacity. So, yep. Uh, Damien Robbie, thank you, Mr. David Reed and Gatewell for bringing us these amazing interviews. You are very welcome. And thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, my, uh, tremendous thanks to my, uh, behind the scenes team, my producer, Linda Gate Gabber Fury, as well as my moderators, Summer, Tracy, Keith, Jeremy, Reese, and Anthony. And big thanks to Frederick Marcou at Concepts Web for uh, the web developer side of Dial the Gate and to Jeremy Heiner, our webmaster who keeps things up to date as well. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. I appreciate you tuning in and we will see you on the other side.